So in this series, we've been talking about runaway believers. How many believe that you are a runaway believer? Or at one time, you were a runaway believer, amen? I believe all of us fall into that category at times. But you know what the beautiful thing is? There's hope for every one of us here today. And our hope is found in Jesus Christ. It's found in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me just comment on that a little bit about what Aaron was talking about. It takes a relationship with the Holy Spirit to get up every morning, to continue on, to endure, to do all that we do as Christians, as people who have the Spirit of God within us. And so as we nurture that relationship, that's what keeps us vibrant. That's what keeps the fire moving in our lives. You know, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, he came with fire. He came with passion to deposit into each and every one of our lives. And so I just encourage you with that as we begin this message today, hope for runaway believers everywhere. And we know that Jonah obviously fits into that category. Ooh, keep my, hand, keep my hands out of my pocket. <laughs> Jonah fits into the description of what a runaway believer is. With God's hand mightily upon him, we've heard from Pastor Sean, Aaron, and Dr. John, as they have shared how God called Jonah to preach to the Ninevites and to spare them from God's judgment. And I believe that's the same message that God is calling all of us here today because there is an impending judgment that is going to come. And it may be sooner or later. <laughs> but it's coming. And I believe that God is raising up a generation today to be like Jonah, to take that message, to shake off the slumber, and to put on all that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us so that we can be his voices so that we can trumpet and herald the sound that God wants to come out of his throne. God is speaking to his church today. The word that he's speaking to his church today is, wake up! Wake up! It's time for believers everywhere to wake up and hear the sound that's emanating from the throne of God. And that's the sound that Jonah heard. He was reluctant about living up to that. But God saw him through, didn't he? He saw him through. And so with God's hand mighty upon him, he began to proclaim that message. Jonah's reluctance to preach the message of repentance to the Ninevites caused him to be thrown into the sea. Sometimes we experience situations in our lives, circumstances in our lives that are not pleasant. And not everything we experience is from the hand of God. I think a lot of it is just from our own reluctance and our own disobedience. And so God has to deal with us just like he had to deal with Jonah. And sometimes those dealings are not pleasant. But we need to, that's when we need to really find the Holy Spirit within us. And to call upon him and say, Lord, how do I walk through this? How do I get through this time? And so Jonah's repentance caused him to be thrown into the sea, only to be rescued by an enormous fish as a result of God's mercy. How many know that in the midst of all that you're going through, God is merciful? He's merciful. He's faithful. He's just. And he loves us so much. He loves us so much, he's not, a, he's not afraid to let us experience a little discomfort. Amen? And so as Jonah 
gets swallowed up and thrown into the sea, gets swallowed up by this fish. The fish finally spits him out. <laughs> Amen. And there he is. He arrives at Nineveh when the big fish spits him out on the beach. We should have that slide up there. So the people in, in Jonah, I'm going to go ahead and just read the passage that I was given. I'm going to start with verse 5, even though Dr. John touched on that last week, but I need verse 5 to pick up the context. And so in verse 5, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Verse 7, And he caused it to be proclaimed, and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. That must have been interesting. Looking at all the animals, the sheep, the goats, being covered with sackcloth. And then they were told to cry mightily to God. I believe that's what God's saying today is, I want you to cry. Cry out for this lost world. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his hands, turn away from his fierce anger, so that we may not perish, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And so, as I said before, every one of us here has been or is a runaway believer. We're all in need of that hope that God has for us, that same hope that he gave to Jonah. Because we've all failed God. How many have failed God? How many failed him this week? <laughs> the truth is, we don't get out of this life unscathed, do we? We have our ups and our downs, but God is always there. You know why? Because he says the righteous man, the righteous woman, gets up seven times. And as I've said before, the greater sin is not in what you sinned. The greater sin is not getting up and running into the arms of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's a merciful and faithful high priest that can, who can sympathize with all of your weaknesses. He can sympathize with all of your struggles. And that's what gives us hope that we can run into his arms each and every time. And that's what sustains us as we walk on in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we march on, as we continue to move forward in him, knowing that he's always there for each and every one of us, no matter what it is that we've done. In the past few weeks, we've seen in the life of Jonah the hope he received despite his stubbornness. He was a stubborn guy. It took getting thrown into the sea to wake him up. Hopefully that'll never happen to any of us. And so he was a runaway believer. And so how many of us can honestly say we have been reluctant and stubborn in our disobedience? We have been stubborn in our obedience to Christ and at times, in times since we've all received him. We've all been there. My hand goes up. I've been there. It happens. So in this section of chapter 3, we discover a God who's faithful. We discover a God who's just, who's always there for us no matter what. Even though Nineveh was corrupt to the core and were cruel oppressors, 
God in his mercy and sovereignty not only gives Jonah a second chance to preach his message of repentance, but he ultimately relents from his purpose of destroying Nineveh. And so the people of Nineveh were into all kinds of stuff. Witchcraft, torture, greed, prostitution, and a myriad of other practices. Yet God showered his mercy upon them by calling Jonah to preach the message of repentance to them. Now just think about this for a moment. We'll get into it more later. But you have to look at our world today. And it's in the same condition that Nineveh was in. We are a carbon copy of the city of Nineveh. And God is concerned. How many believe God is concerned? How many believe God has a plan? <laughs> Amen. And so as we've seen from the previous messages from the book of Jonah, he was a reluctant prophet who was running from his call. And so the story of Jonah is really a story of God's unfailing love for humankind, this fight, the resistance to him. How many believe God loves every single rotten sinner in the world? <laughs> that he loves even those who are blaspheming him today. Even those who are just blaringly shouting and lifting up every incredible rotten sin that there is. He loves them. His heart goes out to them. And so the story of Jonah and the city of Nineveh is a story of God's amazing power and love amid all the hatred and the debauchery that was part of their culture. Same stuff that's part of our culture today. And so even though Jonah was a runaway believer from his calling, God proved to him he was a God of second chances. How many believe God wants to give the world another opportunity. You know, I, I believe this with all my heart. I, I may believe in God's sovereignty. You have to believe in God's sovereignty. You have to understand God's sovereignty. And God has a sovereign will, a sovereign purpose. He has prophetic promises that affect every one of our lives and all the people in this world. He's there. And he desires to bring all of that to pass. And in the midst of that, he's raising up a people. He's raising up a church that will carry that banner, that will preach that message. And so maybe you're here today and you're a runaway believer. You may not have fully embraced or pursued the calling that's in your life, well, I want to tell you today, there's hope for you. There's for, hope for you, as you will see in this message. And so I want to share you, with you a little bit today my story of a, as a runaway believer. I spent three years, three long years, after having an incredible experience with God, of tasting his glory and his understanding, his revelation and all of that, I ran from it. And I ran hard as a runaway believer. That's a picture of me back in 1973, I think that was. But I want, to start with, I grew up in a solid Christian family. My parents were believers. They were Nazarenes. If any of you know what a Nazarene is, they are, well, they were back in those days, <laughs> legalists to the max. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go to movies. I wasn't allowed to go to dances. I wasn't allowed to play cards. I wasn't allowed to play, go to carnivals or do anything that all my friends did. And so I grew up very lonely, ostracized from everybody in a sense, not being a part of what they were all doing. And I went to church every Sunday morning. I went to church every Sunday night. Hopefully, I, I don't think we had to go on Wednesday, thankfully. <laughs> but they had church. My mom always went. 
But, um, you know, during those days, I can remember the first time I ever went to the altar and bowed down. I was about 10 years old. I remember that my age because my grandfather was there, and he died in 1960, so I had to be at least 10 years old, no older. And I can remember going to the altar and giving my life to Christ. But never, nothing ever came of that. Um, I was just stubborn, I guess. I even got baptized about that age, I think. I've been baptized three times. <laughs> but anyway, you know, as I grew into my teen years, I, I got a job that took me away from having to go to church every Sunday. I worked on the weekends. <laughs> um, and so I was getting, you know, at that time, it was, I was beginning to understand what had happened, you know, that, you know, I don't like this not being able to do this or not being able to do that or whatever, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and so once I had my own car, my mom couldn't handle us very much anymore. <laughs> and so I became kind of a wild teenager. And then I joined the Army. In 1969, I joined the Army. In 1970, I found myself in Vietnam. And the reason I went to Vietnam, uh, um, I actually enlisted in the Army, because back in those days, they had the draft, and I was up. I was already, I was classified 1A, I had already taken my physical, and a lot of the guys that I took my physical with were already drafted, and I'm thinking, I don't want to be a grunt. I don't want to go to Vietnam and have to kill people or get killed. I don't want to do all that. So I walked into my recruiter, and I said, I want to enlist but I don't want to have to kill anybody. <laughs> he says, sign up for aviation. And so I did. And I went to, after basic training, I went to AIT to a helicopter school where I learned how to work on helicopters, Chinook helicopters, learned how to be a door gunner. And that's where I found myself in 1970 in Phuloi, Vietnam. I had a wonderful job. I, that's my truck that I drove. I actually had three, three different trucks that I drove. I had a fuel truck, I had the maintenance truck, and then I had the ground handling truck where I hauled helicopters from one place to another, towed them around. And I was happy with that. I, I was having fun. I was enjoying it. I was finally in with a group of guys where we were all doing things together, mainly just smoking pot. <laughs> Yeah, I was. <laughs> but you know what happened? One day, something happened. I had to go to the dispensary. I had to get another shot of penicillin. And before the doctor could even pull the needle out of me, I went into granddaddy convulsions and almost died right there. Took four or five medics to hold me down and get me under control. And all of a sudden, life wasn't good anymore. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was scary, I was scared. And so I, I basically recovered from that. I got back to my barracks and uh, I was on rest. I could rest for the rest of the day. But later that night, I was laying in my bunk or earlier in the evening, I started feeling like I was gonna go through it all over again. And so I, I went and got the orderly clerk to take me to the dispensary in hope of getting some tranquilizers just to calm me down. I think I was basically having an anxiety attack. I didn't even know what those were back in the day. But um, I was freaking out. I thought I was gonna die. And as I was dry, as he was driving me down to the dispensary, I started praying to the God I knew. Here's the thing about my life. I have never known what it's like not to believe. I've always believed in Jesus Christ. Always. I don't know what it's like to be totally lost without him. I know what it's like to be lost in the sense that you're backsliding and you know, turning your back and all that. But even in those days, 
I always knew I was a believer. But I was a runaway believer. I was running hard. And so I got back to my barracks and I'm in my bunk laying down. And all of a sudden, my whole life flashes before me. I started having a vision. And I saw everything from my earliest ages, even memories that I didn't know existed. I, I was awakened to them. And God began to show me how his hand was on my life. At each stage of my life, how he was there. He was with me, bringing me right up to that point. And then he took me into the future. And he imparted his calling on me. He said, in the future, I'm going to give you prophetic understanding of all that's going to happen. And actually, oh, here's the book of my testimony. If you want, it's available out in the foyer afterwards. But this is the book that came out of that. It's called Prophetic Purposes and the Zeal of the Lord. And it's all that I have learned since that day. And so God has been with me at every stage. Later on, a few months later, and, and at that time I quit smoking, I, no, I kept smoking pot, I quit doing hard drugs. At that time I had been just starting to dabble in heroin and LSD, I was taking LSD a, few, a little bit, I hadn't really gotten into it big time, maybe four or five times. And um, I think I shot up speed one time and then I overdosed on it. That, that, that scared, <laughs> that really scared me. I never, I, I never touched speed, I wouldn't say never touched it, but not like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I always, I always respected that and I respected hard drugs in the sense, I knew they were dangerous. And so I dabbled in them, but I never really got fully strung out on them. I go through minor withdrawals at times. But I'd been, at this time, it was, um, I'd been in Vietnam maybe nine month, eight, nine months. And my mom had given me a Bible, a little New Testament living Bible. And I had another Bible in my locker that was given to me by a friend of ours whose son was in the Green Berets and had gotten killed in Vietnam. And so I had those two little Bibles in my locker, untouched, for nine months. And then one morning, just out of nowhere, it had to be the Lord. I reached in and picked up that living Bible. And I took it to work with me. At that time, we were working in a place, I was working in what we called the boneyard. If you can find that boneyard slide, I know I'm way off on the slides. Um, the boneyard was where they kept all the wrecked helicopters. And um, this is where they put all the potheads. So we could just... <laughs> that was our place of duty. I, I, I mean, um, I still drove my truck once in a while, um, but um, that's where I hung out most of the day, just sitting out there smoking pot all day long and getting into trouble. Um, we, we had... We had um, tear gas grenades and real grenades and uh, C4 stuff uh, hidden all over back there. Because we, we, would, we would never hurt anybody, but we wanted to scare them. And so we would make these, these bombs. We had this old swimming pool that had these circular tubes. And we would take the C4, and we had a little clicker, and, and we put the C4 down in the tube, and then we stuff it with th two or three cans of oil. And then, then we hit that clicker and off in the air about 500 feet or more with this big firebomb that would shoot up. And so they would come out and they would find all our stuff, and we didn't care. We just wanted, to know, we just wanted them to know what we had. Um, but we never got busted for any of that stuff because they couldn't prove who it was. But anyway, that's the kind of person I was back in those days. But on this particular day, I come out there in front of all these guys and pull out my Bible and start reading it, and at the same time, lighten up a joint. 
That's just where I was then. And another guy, I think it's this guy right here with the glasses on. His name is Mike. He did the same thing. And you know what happened? Instant, almost instantly, the Jesus movement just amongst all of us. All of a sudden, we're all getting into Jesus. We're all getting into Jesus. And that went on for, you know, a couple months. For, I mean, but we, we, we didn't fully repent. We kept smoking pot. I quit doing all hard drugs, but I kept smoking pot. And so the seeds of the gospel were being planted, even in the midst of my, my rebellion and my running and all of that. I was still a runaway believer. But God saw me through it, thankfully. And then after I came home from Vietnam, my buddy from Fremont, California came up to visit me. We'd gotten kicked out of the army together. That's another thing I'm really ashamed of. I really, seriously, I was, not a, I was a good soldier for a while. But then when things started going crooked on me, I said, I gotta figure a way to get out of here instead of spending three years. And so I ended up getting a general discharge and being out of the army after 21 months with a general under honorable conditions discharge. So I have all the benefits even though I was a terrible soldier. But I regret, I regret all of that, I really do. Because that's not who I am today. Christ has changed me, transformed my life. But as I came home, I continued in my ways of being a runaway believer. And I remember I, my buddy Jack and I, we were hanging out with a bunch of hippies from Minnesota. I was living up in where I grew up in North Central Washington. And we were all hanging out together. And one day they said, you know, I think we're all gonna go back to Minnesota. We'd all been picking apples in this orchard somewhere and they were just fed up with it. They said, why don't you guys come along with us? I said, okay. We can do that. And so we all made plans to jump on a freight train and ride a freight train from where I lived in Washington all the way to Minneapolis. I had to, I had to go back home at that time because I, I was living down in the city. My parents' home was kind of out in the country a little bit where I had my pack and all my stuff. And um, I, was, I went down the basement and got all my stuff and was coming up the steps. And my mom decided to park herself right in front of me. And she says, Kenny, you're running from God. That's the first time I ever heard that term, running from God. And of course, I argued with her and I says, I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'll work it all out. <laughs> but um, I was running from God. And then after my, we got to Minnesota, my friends decided they wanted to go back to Washington. I said, I'm not, go, I'm not ready to go back. And so I took off by myself. I had already been on another hitchhiking trip where I went from Washington all the way to Philadelphia or Pennsylvania or somewhere. And so, I, you know, I was kind of adjusted to that kind of thing. And so I took off for Phoenix, Arizona. We'd been in a record shop a few days earlier and I saw the album by Grand Funk called Phoenix. That was my leading. <laughs> I said, well, that sounds like a good place. I think I'll just go to Phoenix. And so on the way to Phoenix, I get stuck in Colorado in my you know, fall clothes and, and it's, it's snowing out there. I mean, it's freezing. I am just sitting there on the side of the road just shivering to death, you know? And um, finally, a guy picks me up there, and he gives me a ride all the way to Phoenix. Talk about God's mercy. And so it's in Phoenix where I met up with Hobo. There's a freight train. <laughs> so, they, so we ended up traveling together for almost a year, hitchhiking and riding freight trains all across from L.A. to Key West, Florida, and living on the beach in Florida and all that kind of stuff, going to New Orleans, um, and just, you know, having a wild time, partying everywhere we went. And then we went north to Madison, Wisconsin, and then back to my home in Wenatchee for a few days. And then we took off for Canada and hitchhiked across Canada. But it was on the way, 
after we left British Columbia, something happened to me. I got, it's, my arm started to swell up. I mean, it swelled, swelled up like a big balloon. And it started freaking me out. And I felt like God was trying to say something to me. All this time, I'm still communicating with God. But I'm running like crazy. I'm still communicating with him. And I began to sense that my time of running was coming to an end. And so when I finally got to Toronto, I split up with Hobo and I said, I'm, I'm heading back. So, and I went back. And that was the end of that life. But as I say, you can catch the rest of that in this book here. But getting back to the story of Jonah, as we get back to his story, we see God's mighty transforming hand upon his life. The message of Jonah, I believe, is an evangelistic message to the church today. You know, I've been listening to some of the old Billy Graham me messages. <laughs> you go on YouTube, and nobody preaches like him anymore. You ever notice that? I mean, he called it like it is. I mean, he, he was like Jonah. Repent! I mean, every sermon had the word repent in it. Every sermon had repent or you're going to go to hell. I mean, he said it so boldly, and it was like, it, back in the day when you listened to that, you'd think that's just the way preachers do. Nobody preaches like that anymore. But I believe the message is coming back to the church to get your lives together, to shake off the sin that's causing you to stumble, to get things in order, get your spiritual life in order. And that's the message that came through loud and clear to the people of Nineveh. I believe much of the Western culture today has been seduced by a watered-down version of the gospel. They've been seduced. We don't know what it's like to really live in self-denial anymore. Our own needs... Our own feelings, our own desires come before self-denial. And that's where a lot of us live. Instead of living where God wants us to live. Now think about your life. Is it built around the cross of self-denial or is it about pleasing yourself? I believe, we, as Paul said, we have to examine ourselves to see if we're really in the faith. What does the overall testimony of your life speak? Does it speak self, or does it speak the cross? In Matthew 16, Jesus said, verse 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. For whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And so as Dr. John shared in his amazing message last week, that we have all been called to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We have all been called to share the gospel to make disciples, teaching them to observe the very things that Jesus taught. But you can't teach people unless you're <laughs> walking in those things, amen? amen? But if you're walking in those things, then start teaching them. Teach disciples, make disciples. And so as we look at the results of Jonah's message, it will begin here in verse 5, just to pick up the context where it says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. They heard the message. And their response was, we believe. We believe what he's saying. And so Jonah's message was kind of like shock therapy to them. Just like the shock therapy I incurred when I had those convulsions. Just like the shock therapy that Jonah experienced 
when he got thrown into the sea. That was shocking. Dr. John shared last week what it must have been like for them. He said it was shocking. But God got their attention, amen? God got their attention. God got my attention that morning in 1970 when I had those convulsions. He got my attention. Even though I was a runaway believer after that, I never forgot. I still haven't ever forgotten that experience. I think about it sometimes and it scares me. I, it just, I, the thought of going through all that, it was just horrific. John's message had not yet reached the royal court. It's just, it's just the common people that now have heard his message. It may have taken some time before the secluded monarch really began to hear what was going on out there in the, in the city. We don't know how long that could have been. But think of what's happening today. We hear about revivals, you know, really big revivals happening where hundreds and thousands of people are getting saved and water baptized. But you know what we don't hear? We don't hear of revival amongst our political leaders. It hasn't reached them yet. It hasn't reached them yet. And so we think, you know, the world needs to get turned around. If we just vote in the right leaders. And, I, and I'm not saying we don't. We need to vote. We need to be responsible in our voting. But if you think your voting is going to change the world, you're going to be severely disappointed. Our only hope is in a sovereign God. Our only hope is in the sovereignty of God. And it's our part to connect with his sovereignty. And it's not that hard to do. All you have to do is start waiting on the Lord. Start seeking, the God, seeking God. Start allowing the Holy Spirit to speak into your life. Open yourself up to Him. When you open the Word up, say pray, you pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, begin to reveal to me. Begin to speak revelation into my spirit. Because God is wanting to do that. He's wanting to speak revelation into our hearts and our spirits so that we can be equipped not just with the Word, but with the Spirit. When the Spirit and the Word come together, there's an explosion that takes place. The Word without the Spirit is legalism. The Spirit without the Word is wildfire. They have to come together. Amen? And so we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to dig into the Word of God. Get to know God. Get to know who He is. How He works. What his sovereignty entails, all of that. And allow the Holy Spirit to intermesh that with our spirits. So that we can rise up as the anointed ones who go forth with a clarion sound, speaking forth God's word uncorrupted, not diluted, but speak his word with clarity to what this world needs today. And when the body of Christ, when the Western culture begins to get it, you know, a lot of the cultures around the world, they've got it. They're getting it. They have, it's not just thousands of people getting saved over there. There's tens of thousands. They're already in revival. And most likely, a lot of them are already in tribulation. The time is coming, folks. The time of sleeping is over. I don't care what state you're in. I need to wake up. We all need to wake up. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his clothing and leave the flesh behind. So what will it take to reach them? First of all, they believe God. Do we believe God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him will not perish? Do we believe that? I believe. Amen. Do we believe God wants to save members of our family? Do we believe God wants to save our friends? Do we believe that God wants to save our neighbors from the wrath to come? 
See, if we start, you know, we've lost the vision of hell, people. We've lost it, and therefore we don't have a, a fire burning in us. We don't care about the unbelievers because a lot of us don't even believe in hell. And there's more and more deceptive teaching coming out in the church today that is all about universalism. Reject it. The, the picture of hell is clear in the Bible. It's clear. Jesus said it would be better to cut your hand off than to go into the fires of hell. The unquenchable fires that burn forever and ever and ever. Our problem is sometimes we just have a whole hum attitude and just accept it as the way things are. There's not much we can do about it. You know, recently, actually, I was looking back, around 2019, the Lord had me start writing poetry, biblical devotional poetry. And what I have discovered in that, that that is a wonderful harvest field. I, I reach thousands and thousands and thousands of people every day with poetry. I find that, that, that people that are into poetry aren't as judgmental. They're not. I very seldom, and I, I do really blatant stuff, only in poetic terms. And I have discovered that people receive that. And, and a lot of the groups that I join are non-believer groups. Those are the ones I want to reach. But I believe we need to find our harvest fields. And so those who experienced Jonah's preaching, they were in the marketplace. They shared it with their families. I mean, think about it. They didn't all hear that message all at once. The people who heard the message started sharing it. That's how everybody heard it. And then the word of God came to the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne and laid aside his robe and covered himself with sackcloth. And then he caused it to be proclaimed and published. What do you think would happen if churches all over the world, if the body of Christ all over the world finally began to take the gospel seriously and begin to raise the banner? Raise the banner of picking up your cross and following Christ. That there would be so much of a cry for repentance, that the people in authority, the governmental leaders couldn't help but hear it. And they would have to finally do something about it. They don't do anything unless they get a lot of people telling them what to do. And so it's time for the church <laughs> to pick up our, our crosses instead of, oh, what is that? That's a cross? What do I do with that? Oh, I'm supposed to pick it up and carry it. Oh, oh, I got it. I take it with me everywhere I go. Take it with me to work. Take it with me to the workout place. I take it to the park. I take it when I go to meet my, with my friends, my family. I, I never go anywhere without it. That's the kind of mentality we have to develop if we're going to win this world. Amen? And so we must ask ourselves, do we believe in a sovereign God who is capable of doing anything he wants? Is he capable of doing the impossible? Jesus said all things are possible to those who believe. That's you. If you believe, all things are possible. 1 John 5.14 says this, and this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. How do we know what his will is? Get in touch with his sovereignty. Get in touch with what his plans and his purposes are. Ask him daily, Lord, how do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do? How, what, what are the words you want me to speak? And then verse 8, but let a man... 
and beasts be covered with sackcloth, sack, sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. And so, you know what's interesting about that? It doesn't say, what, what turned the heart of God? It wasn't their sacrifices. It wasn't any of that stuff. It was their repentance. It's when they said, okay, Lord, I'll do this. It's when, when Jonah says, okay, I'll do this. When you say, okay, I will do it. I will do whatever you ask me to do. That's when things start to change. And then you follow through with it. And so what would happen if believers everywhere began to pray fast and turn from their wicked ways? Do you think our leaders would hear the message loud and clear that they would turn and proclaim and publish it throughout the world? Who can tell, verse 9, if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? I believe that our God, as I said earlier, is a fair and just God who will display his glory throughout the body of Christ for all to see before he sends his son to reap the harvest. I believe that. God is going to cause the full measure to come into his body. And we're going to stand up like sons of God, anointed by God, and be his mouthpiece. The picture in the book of Joel says he utters his great voice before his great army. And that's what God wants to do, is utter his voice through you to champion his pur purposes. So I want to close now with the end of my story. After I'd been home for about a year, my brother and his wife wanted to get their baby dedicated to the Lord. They tricked me into going to church. <laughs> and so I got to church, and nothing happened till the end. They started singing one of those Billy Graham songs. I think it was Almost Persuaded or Just As I Am or one of those songs. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came over me. I mean, it was like I was mesmerized. It was like I was standing outside of my body watching this guy put this hymnal back in the slot and walk down to the altar. And that's where I've been ever since. I, I'm going to read you now, and we'll close with this a poem that I wrote about myself. It's, caught, it's called Caught in the Pursuit of a Lost Soul. It's in this book. In panic, crying out in desperation, I wanted to be free. Discovering you in captivation, my life flashed before me. Like a fish with a hook in its mouth, I was caught. Not ready to submit, I fought the hook, trying to spit it out. Jerking the line periodically, I knew you were still there. Why do I run, fighting your hook, resisting being captured? Freight train hopping from one place to another, I often wondered. With the hook set, reeling me in periodically, I resisted. Letting go again and again, I returned to sin and stubbornness. How long will your patience last, I wondered in my distress. Breaking me down. Your patience exhausted me, little by little. Raging on, the battle for my soul continued in non-committal. What was it I resisted? Your unfailing love or fear of surrender? Lost in a spiritual maze of philosophies, I stood in wonder. What was it discovered so long ago drawing me so near? Not giving in, stubbornly refusing, I stood in denial. Lost in confusion, I desired but didn't quite know how. Blindsided, caught in a hypnotic trance, I finally decided. In a moment of intense struggle, worn out, I caved. With the battle over, I was wrapped in the arms of your love. With your patience taking opportunity, you waited to intercept. 
outwitting stubbornness and deception without force, you drew. Leading to a moment of awe-inspiring revelation, my spirit leapt. It was you I looked for all along. Why did I wait so distraught? Forever grateful for your pursuit of a lost soul, I was caught. And so today, I want to pray for everybody here. Whether you admit to being a believer that's running, a runaway believer or not, I believe God wants to capture you heart, soul, and spirit. Amen? Amen. He wants you to lead. He wants to lead you to that place where you are wrapped in the beauty and the warmth of his arms continually. So let's pray. Father, we come to you today. We ask your mercy and grace upon each and every person here today. God, that you would touch hearts. You would cause us all to rise up and be the sons of God, daughters of God that you've called us to be. That we would rise as the anointed ones, Lord, and be and do all that you've called us to do. That we would be your voice in the midst of darkness. We would be your voice in the midst of confusion. We would be your voice where trouble and anguish and all of that exists. That your voice would penetrate the hearts and people caught in, your dar caught in darkness everywhere, Lord. And so help us, Lord, to be as sympathetic to them as you are to us. That they would look to us, Lord, and see hearts of mercy, hearts of compassion. People who are not caught in legalistic things, but yet with a love that emanates from your throne coming out from each and every one of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.